Spider-Man Unlimited is arguably the weirdest Spider-Man adaptation of all time. Arguably. Written as a loose follow-up to Spider-Man the Animated Series of the 90s, and I do mean loose, this series took an entirely different approach to telling a Spidey story. I would argue that this show nearly feels like it was written as an entirely different show with its own characters and lore, and then they decided to just drop Spidey and a few recognizable Spider-Man characters into the mix. Now there's no evidence that this is what they did, but it does kind of feel like it. And that isn't necessarily a criticism either, because while it is absolutely an anomaly in the long list of Spider-Man animated series, it has a ton of charm and some really interesting characters. Plus, we're about to see this version of Spidey again in the upcoming Across the Spider-Verse film. Wild times. So join me as we dive deep into the absurdity of Spider-Man Unlimited. Spider-Man Unlimited had a very tumultuous pre-production, one in which the concept of the series shifted around multiple times. You would think that after the success of Spider-Man the Animated Series, and with that series ending on a cliffhanger, you'd do a proper follow-up. And while this is technically a follow-up, it doesn't exactly feel like it. But even before they landed on the premise, there were different ideas in play. Initially, it was meant to be a low-budget adaptation of the first 26 issues of the original run of the Amazing Spider-Man comic books. However, with Sony and Marvel Marvel's production of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man film in the works, they were barred from adapting these stories and couldn't even use the original Spidey suit for the duration of the show. After this, they even toyed with the idea of doing a Spider-Man 2099 adaptation starring Miguel O'Hara, which is especially interesting given Miguel's prominence in the upcoming Across the Spider-Verse film and the inclusion of Spider-Man Unlimited in that movie. However, they opted against this story and instead crafted a new narrative far away from the original comics run set on a parallel world called Counter-Earth. The initial idea for their Counter-Earth story was that on Counter-Earth, Uncle Ben had never died, and therefore that Earth's Peter Parker did not have the moral fortitude to resist the symbiote suit, eventually becoming Venom. So when our Peter arrives and tries to meet up with Counter-Peter, he's actually met with the antagonist of the entire series. And honestly, to me, this idea sounds great. Potentially exploring Peter through a parallel version who has faltered years before Spider-Verse, mind you. And even the idea of Uncle Ben being a supporting character, this just had a ton of potential if you ask me. I really love the way writer-producer Will Munio described this arc for Peter. Dealing with the counter-earth Spidey slash Venom was intended to be the main subplot, and by the end, Peter would have gone home with the knowledge that the hardships of his origin had made him the good man he'd become. Sounds like some quality Spider-Man to me. However, the folks at Marvel panicked because of the poor reception of the Clone Saga in the comic books and forbid them from doing a series with multiple Peter Parkers, which, yes, is very stupid, especially now given the success of Spider-Verse and No Way Home. So after adjusting and adapting their ideas to remove the parallel Parker, they landed on the story that we all know and love. Or, at least, the one that some of us have seen. Interestingly, while the 90s animated series used a combination of digital ink and cell animation, this series switched entirely to cell animation. The style is notably different, and there's a lot of charm. I particularly love the way it uses pitch black for the shadows and shading on characters. It gives some of it almost a black light poster vibe. It's cool. The series premiered in October 1999, and over the next two weeks aired three three total episodes. However, due to struggling ratings compared to rival shows, they ended up shelving the series and relaunching it about a year later in late 2000, this time airing all 13 episodes. The series definitely tries to be cooler and edgier than the previous animated series, and the title sequence really highlights this with a synthy, futuristic new theme song and some pretty stylish visuals. The two-part premiere titled Worlds Apart opens revealing John Jameson's plan to use a warp drive to travel to the newly discovered Counter-Earth. There, Alita discovered an exact duplicate of our world the counter earth. It's also described as being on the far side of the sun. They don't really go into any further detail explaining why an exact duplicate of earth exists within the solar system or why it requires a warp drive to reach the other side of the sun, but that's what they went with. We'll get more into the exact duplicate nature of counter earth later because it gets kind of wild. As John Jameson takes off in his shuttle, Venom and Carnage stow away on board and Peter jumps into action to attempt to stop them. This is the single moment in Unlimited where we hear the previous iconic spike theme. What could possibly be Interestingly, Venom and Carnage are both shown to have entirely new abilities, appearing to have no host bodies at all. Hey, 
You two could never morph like that before. It's revealed later that they are still using Brock and Cassidy's bodies, but the way they turn entirely into pure symbiote goo definitely had me confused for a minute. So Spidey is unable to stop the symbiote duo, they board the ship, and John calls for help before going through the portal. And with Spidey floating back down to Earth, as you might expect, Jonah Jameson blames the entire thing on Spider-Man and puts out a $10 million reward to identify or capture him. Wild. The thing that cracked me up here is that the entire city really does turn on Spider-Man. Dude couldn't even save a cat from a tree without getting maced. He saves a woman and her baby from falling to their death, and firefighters immediately turn their hoses on him, and he still saves one of their lives. I do think this aspect is a pretty solid setup for the series. It plays off a lot of the Spidey tropes we've come to love and expect, that being Spider-Man is an absolutely thankless job. For Peter, doing the right thing is not often rewarded. And I like that this idea immediately reaches a boiling point as a catalyst for the series premise. And the world actually ends up believing that Spidey died in the firefighting incident, which gives him the opportunity to leave Counter-Earth and try to save John Jameson from the symbiote duo. So Peter makes himself a sick new suit. This year's fully loaded model features nanotechnology, discreetly borrowed from the lab of Reed Richards. A nice Reed Richards name drop. Plus, as it turns out, this started the nanotechnology trend that everybody absolutely hates in the MCU. Thanks, Spidey. But man, I do love this suit design. Maybe one of my favorite Spider-Man suits ever. Spidey hijacks another shuttle with slight resistance from a jetpack sporting Nick Fury, and he heads to counter Earth. They do a good job table setting Peter's departure from Earth for the most part, and though the series is about to fly off the rails into entirely new territory, it's still rooted in Spidey as a character. Remember what Uncle Ben said, MJ? great power comes great responsibility. There are some really gorgeous shots of Peter approaching Counter-Earth, but this is where it truly starts to feel like he's thrust into a different series entirely. His ship is tractor beamed down to Counter-Earth's New York City, and he's confronted with these guys. We are the Knights of Wondagore. I am known to all as Lord Tiger. I told you, it feels like an entirely separate franchise. This planet is filled with both humans and beings called Beastials, these four knights being particularly powerful in the hierarchy. There's a bear lady named Ursula, a ram dude named Sir Ram, and this woman named Lady Vermin, who they say is a rat lady, but like... Where's the rat? And she's super into Spidey, too. We should not do battle, stranger, for you are most fair to Lady Vermin's eyes. And you are most rat-like to my own. Honestly, I love it when an antagonist is horned up for Spidey, so I'm glad they kept this trope even in this unusual setting. Speaking of unusual setting, I really like the sequence where Spidey recognizes how different Counter-Earth actually is, bouncing off of hover cars and traffic, realizing everyone is an animal person. What is this? The Manhattan Island of Dr. Moreau? Honestly, this is one of the best Spidey quips I have ever heard in my life. Incredible stuff. Eventually, Spidey is captured by the Knights of the Wondagore, and man, I do not understand and how these dudes live in Manhattan and talk like this. But be he human or bestial, tis certain that he is a valiant warrior. But then we're introduced to the real series antagonist, the High Evolutionary, though not in person yet. But this is the exact stuff I'm talking about when I say this feels like a separate franchise that Spidey was dropped into. Everything about how these people speak, their goals, their ridiculously over-designed armor, it feels like a different show. And maybe that was intentional. Spidey is a fish out of water after all, so maybe they were trying to convey that to the audience as blatantly as possible? That being said, the entire bestial idea is the biggest ask as an audience member, at least for me. I know that's silly coming from someone who also talks about BoJack Horseman regularly, but I think it has more to do with the way it's implemented into the already existing Spidey world and lore. Counter-Earth being an exact duplicate that is simply on the far side of the sun is already a funny premise, but that same Counter-Earth being filled with anthropomorphic animal people is kind of a hat on a hat, right? It's a shame they didn't make this show after the rise of online furry culture because it probably would have gotten like six seasons. And unfortunately, the entire bestial idea doesn't have a particularly satisfying explanation either. The High Evolutionary apparently came to this planet seeking utopia. They don't say where he came from, just that he came here seeking utopia and was disappointed that all he found was the same war and conflict that he was used to. To have my paradise. I would have to build it myself. But apparently, the perfect society consists of animal-human hybrids of the High Evolutionary's design? He claims they're stronger and better and free from the problems created by humans without really elaborating on why. But I guess they have built this crazy futuristic city, so there's that. But the city is also New York City? Because exact duplicate? 
I guess. But obviously the entire conflict in this series is that it is not a perfect society, as the bestials have relegated humans to the lowest levels of the city, or what they call the basement. And so Spidey's main allies are a team of rebels led by John Jameson, who rescue him from the high evolutionary. There are three main rebels other than John, and the show actually does eventually give them all pretty compelling backstories. There's Karen O'Malley, the most normal named rebel, Daniel Bromley, who just goes by Bromley, and of course, Git Hoskins. After being experimented on as a kid, Git now looks like a mummy, but he has complete control over his bandages, almost Mr. Fantastic style. A real ragtag group, if I don't say so myself. And somehow, all led by John Jameson, who came to counter Earth very recently. Not sure how he secured that gig. I did like how skeptical Jameson was that this was actually Spidey though, which leads to this question, and in my opinion, a potentially big problem that they conveniently wrote around. Who's the punk photographer that always gets those great pictures of you for the Daily Bugle? Uh... Peter Parker. Okay, the problem here is that by the end of these first two episodes, Peter is now living on Counter Earth in the basement. He ends up having multiple mutual friends with John Jameson and living with one of them. All it would have taken is a character mentioning Peter a single time, and Jameson would have been able to figure out that he's Spider Man. And honestly, maybe he should have. There are a few episodes where it feels very convenient that it isn't brought up or revealed to him. Peter's very lucky he didn't run into him on the street. So the other big players in this season are, of course, Venom and Carnage, who came to Counter Earth to fulfill their own symbiote related master plan. They're temporarily working for the High Evolutionary, but really only to further their own scheme. I gotta say, while I do mostly like Venom's design in the show, I kinda hate Carnage. He looks so cool in the comics and in the previous animated series, but in this they make him this big, angular, lumbering skeleton thing. Honestly, he kinda reminds me of those gigantic Home Depot skeletons. Not really a fan, but those are most of the major players in the battle for Counter Earth, save for a couple important ones who we will meet later. And they wrap up the two-part premiere introducing us to the important players in Peter's personal life on Counter Earth. Peter saves a kid named Shane from one of the High Evolutionary's sentry robots, and his mother, a doctor named Naoko, treats his injuries. Peter ends up staying with them during his time on Counter Earth and forms a great genuine bond with them both. This gets pretty interesting later too, but we'll get there. So. As you may have noticed, talking through the very beginning of this series required a lot of description and recap. Usually when we talk about these Spider-Man series, we're talking about characters, scenarios, stories, and lore that we're all mostly familiar with in one way or another. It's usually just about how they adapted elements we already know. But this is one of the most unusual Spidey shows because the vast majority of the story is new territory. New planet, new characters, new species, new lore. Everything is completely unfamiliar, which can actually be really exciting from an audience perspective perspective, but it also means I do have to do a lot more table setting to talk about the show compared to other Spider-Man series. In fact, the only characters who show up regularly that actually come from the Spider-Man stories we know are Peter himself, John Jameson, Venom, and Carnage. Now, there will be a few more familiar villains coming up, but they're all counter-earth twisted versions, different characters entirely. But now that we've set the table, talking through the rest of the season shouldn't be quite as laborious. And while it was a lot to convey, the two premiere episodes did do an effective job setting up the stakes and establishing countless new characters and concepts. I also really dig the way the series uses these comic book panel chirons for transitions and establishing locations. Such a simple idea that is super effective and helps convey the comic booky nature of the series really well. The first time I watched this show, it was shortly after finishing the 90s animated series, so it took me a bit to get used to Reno Romano's take on Peter Parker, but the more I watched the show, the more I really grew to appreciate his performance. I think he makes a really solid Peter and Spidey. Crazy enough, Reno would go on to play Bruce Wayne slash Batman a few years later in the animated series The Batman. Are there any other voice actors who have played both Peter Parker and Bruce Wayne? What a resume. I did laugh pretty hard at the opening of the third episode. In the end of the second episode, Naoko tells Peter he can stay with them rent free for a couple of weeks while he gets on his feet, and then immediately in the third episode, she is demanding the rent. I guess no matter what version of Earth Peter is on, somebody's angry about the rent. <laughs> Unfortunately, their argument upsets Shane, who runs away, and when going after him, Naoko is pulled into the sewers by this big green symbiote thing, which sets the stage for what I think is a pretty great third episode. Enter Green Goblin, but not the one we know. Counter Earth has its own goblin, and he isn't a villain, he's a fellow vigilante. I actually really love this version of the character. He's maybe slightly over-designed, like some of the 
the other original characters in the show, but I find his overdesign much more charming, and giving him wings rather than a glider fits in with the whole bestial aspect of Counter Earth really well. But he's got a very fun personality, and the sort of reluctant team up aspect of his relationship with Spidey really works for me. Spidey is obviously skeptical because he looks like regular Earth's Green Goblin, and this goblin is skeptical of Spidey because he looks like Venom and Carnage. Right, you're not with Venom and Carnage, you're a completely unrelated superpowered guy in a spider suit. There are a few characters who Spidey has to reluctantly team up with over the series, and it's just a dynamic that works for me. Goblin is probably my favorite of all of them, they have some really quality back and forth banter. However, one of the weirder quirks is that this Green Goblin just sort of throws out random pop culture quotes. It's not easy being green. Hidey ho, neighborinos. Rumors of my demise are greatly exaggerated. So, to recap, those quotes are Kermit the Frog, Ned Flanders, and Mark Twain. Does this imply that the Muppets, the Simpsons, and an alternate version of Mark Twain all exist on Counter Earth? Or is this guy just like the weirdest wordsmith to ever exist? But regardless, Goblin's few appearances are a genuine highlight of Spider Man Unlimited. It's a really cool take on the character, and I really dug the action when he and Spidey team up. This early scene sequence where Spidey makes a huge web shield and Goblin launches his explosives from out behind it is really dope. And there's a great shot towards the end where Goblin flies Spidey out of the collapsing underground base. I also really liked the very heavy implication that Goblin is actually Hector Jones, Shane's father, and Naoko's ex-husband. Though this was never explicitly realized within the text of the show, it was very obvious that this was the case. Goblin is immediately more familiar with both Naoko and Shane than you'd expect. Plus, there's this line at the end of the episode after they save Naoko who says she hopes that she sees him again. I hope so too, my love. So yeah, if this isn't Hector, he's just creepy. <laughs> There are actually a couple of Spidey Unlimited comics, and one of them contradicts this, saying Shane's father is actually a bestial version of Wolverine, but I don't think we can consider those canon because it is so painfully obvious that the series was setting up the Hector Goblin reveal. And it's a genuine shame they never got further with that either, because I think the whole Peter, Naoko, Hector triangle could have been really interesting. Peter's relationship with Shane and Naoko was an aspect of Unlimited that really worked for me, for the most part. The way both Naoko and Shane slowly started to respect Peter was really well done. Initially, Naoko didn't trust Peter would be able to get her the rent, and Shane actually pretty vocally called him a wuss when they reminisced about how Spidey saved Naoko from the symbiotes. Yeah, you called the police. It's okay, Peter. You wanted to help. And obviously, this is a common Spidey problem. Peter disappears because he has to help as Spidey, so people think that Peter is a coward. I can't believe Peter is such a coward, I'm running off like that. He didn't run, Mom. He's just taking pictures. You'll see. But as you can see, over the course of the season, Naoko and Shane both come around on Peter. I told you he wasn't a coward. And you were right, Shane. I am so glad. And Peter is even shown spending quality one-on-one -on -one time with Naoko and Shane, giving Shane the kind of support a father figure would. The longer I'm stuck on this planet, the more Shane and Naoko feel like family to me. But if I'm being honest, it also feels like a bit of a missed opportunity. Because while they do blatantly say that Peter sees them as family, and is even attracted to Naoko, the series also places MJ back on Earth waiting for Peter. And obviously, it's hard to just write off Peter's longtime love interest, but I sort of wish they had somehow for the series, because one of the majorly important aspects of any Spidey media is that they have to show him truly struggle to balance his personal life and his superhero life. And to me, the highest stakes instances of this are always related to Peter's love life. How does Peter fumble the bag because of his great responsibility? And while there certainly are aspects of this in his relationship with Naoko and Shane, I think if they had been able to fully embrace a romantic relationship, it would have increased the stakes significantly. Instead, they sort of have this half in the bag situation where Peter and Naoko definitely have feelings for each other, but because of a character on another planet that literally only appeared in the pilot episode, they can't fully explore a romance. It actually makes me wish that Unlimited had more blatantly embraced the end of Spider-Man the Animated Series, where Peter had yet to find Mary Jane after she was thrown through the Goblin's portal, or if you don't want to be that directly tied to those stories, just have Mary Jane tell Peter she can't have a long distance relationship across the solar system with him. I mean, that's pretty reasonable, and it opens up the series to the romantic drama that generally works really well for Spider-Man. Man. Though there are a couple instances where they played the existing circumstances pretty well. Don't worry, MJ. MJ? 
sorry, my mistake. But ironically, I also felt they stayed too true to other aspects of Spidey's mainstays where they could have afforded to differentiate themselves on Counter-Earth, particularly that they just have Peter continue to take photos of Spider-Man for a living, even on this entirely different planet. I guess it was just initially a little bit of a stretch for me that Spidey would show up and immediately be the most in-demand photos in Counter New York, enough so that Peter can make an entire living on it. And I guess this isn't all that implausible, but straight up replacing a character as iconic as Jonah Jameson in the exact same role is not an easy task. A hundred bucks a piece, final off. Mr. Minio? Do you mind if I call you JJ? They actually named and designed Peter's new boss after Unlimited's lead producer, Will Munio, which is a funny inside joke, but I cannot pretend the character is even remotely as memorable as Jonah Jameson. It makes me think more than anything that maybe they should have found a new angle for Peter's employment while on Counter Earth, especially because this was just another way Peter should have been easily figured out by John Jameson. Peter's name is in the paper under every picture of Spider Man. I mean, come on. Or if they're committed to the photography gig, just use more direct parallel characters on Counter Earth, like they initially planned with Counter Peter. Just throw an alternate Jonah into the mix. That could have also made for some interesting drama with John Jameson. Though ultimately, I do really enjoy the alternate Spidey villains that are parallel without being the exact same characters. I already brought up Goblin, but there are also Craven, Vulture, and Electro parallels that all sort of do their own thing. Counter Earth Craven is simply known as the Hunter and probably has the least unique spin on any of these parallel villains, but still has a very solid design. He basically works as a mercenary for anyone who will hire him, including Beastials and the High Evolutionary, and as you'd expect, he's tasked with capturing Spider-Man. Electro is a bit more fun, the one example of a parallel villain who is actually a bestial, though they don't ever fully vocalize what he is. My initial thought is that he's a literal electric eel, which would be dope, but he's kind of more lizard-like. He doesn't have all that much going on for him outside of the cool look, though. Vulture gets a bit more of a unique counter-Earth backstory that I actually enjoyed, and like Goblin, this version is actually more of a hero than a villain. Vulture grew up a rich kid, so rich that the other bestial kids were cool hanging with him. But his actual best friend was a kid named Cliff, the son of his family's housekeeper. But while hanging around with the Beastials, they would regularly terrorize humans, and one day they ended up lighting Cliff's house on fire. But the look on his face changed my life. I vowed to do everything I could to stop human suffering. Though I gotta say, Spidey is absolutely in full hypocrite mode talking to Vulture about this crime fighting here. Like, how did he even get these words out seriously? A lot of folks feel strongly about something, but they don't take it to the streets. Really, Spidey? You're gonna lecture someone about taking things to the streets? So much for great responsibility. Actually, if I'm being honest, there are a handful of moments in the show that rub me the wrong way in terms of Spidey's motivations. He sticks around to help Jameson and the Rebels, but if Jameson didn't want to stay, Spidey would 100% have left Counter Earth. Look, John John, there's nothing I'd like better than to see the Beasties take a nosedive, but this isn't our fight. I feel like what they were going for is the idea that being so far from home in such an unfamiliar place really challenges Peter's moral fortitude in regard to with great power comes great responsibility, which is an idea I like fine on paper. I just wish they had shown more of a complete growth cycle for Peter to come around and realize that he's wrong. Because as is, there are just a series of moments like these where Spider-Man is actually acting very un-Spider-Man like. There's even a perfect moment where they could have shown Spidey's epiphany. In the ninth episode of the season, Peter actually gets an opportunity to take his ship back to Earth. He nearly leaves counter Earth, but unfortunately he can't board the ship in time and uses his webbing to alter its course and uh, basically 9-11 the High Evolutionary's technodrome looking base. But this feels like a missed opportunity for Peter to have actually made the decision to sacrifice his ability to go home so that he can continue to help counter Earth. As it stands, it plays out like it was his only real option, but this could have been a situation that brings his crisis of great responsibility to a close in a very satisfying way. But there are a couple of truly great episodes that showcase Peter embracing great responsibility. The first that I absolutely love is the fifth episode, Steel Cold Heart, where Peter meets one of the High Evolutionary's sentry robots called X-51, who's malfunctioning after being in service for over 20 years. Peter recognizes that X-51 has a higher level of sentience than the other robots. Please, help you might be a glorified toaster, pal, but that's one request I can't turn down. I love that Peter treats X-51 like a person, even when others won't. Jameson wants to trade him in exchange for Bromley, but Peter even stands up to his own allies to do what's right. Hey, ground control to Major John. X-51 is not a thing, he's a person. And after X-51 helps the rebels and they rescue Bromley, Jameson admits that he was wrong. I owe you an apology, Spider-Man. It's not me you should be apologizing to, John. 
It's X-51. This is what I like to see out of this show. Spidey standing up for what's truly right in the face of opposition from his own allies. That's true responsibility through adversity. X-51 ends up joining the team too, and I like that their little ragtag group of rebels slowly grows as the season progresses. But the absolute crown jewel of Spider-Man Unlimited episodes is one is the loneliest number. Not only an incredible Spidey story, but an incredible Eddie Brock story. When Beastials steal the Venom symbiote from Brock, Eddie nearly dies and Spidey has to help him. But you're not Venom, are you? You're a human being. But because of how thoroughly Eddie bonded with the symbiote, he actually needs it to survive. So the dilemma Spidey finds himself in is that in order to do the right thing and save Brock, he has to ensure the survival of one of his greatest enemies and threats. But I can't sit back and watch a man die. Not even you, Eddie. But the lengths that Peter goes to maintain that responsibility and save Eddie are what make this an even greater story. After securing the symbiote, Peter realizes that it cannot survive for long without a human host. So, in order to get it back to Eddie before it perishes, he dons the black costume for the first time in years, acting as the symbiote's life support. And Eddie's half of the story is incredible as well, as Naoko and Shane actually appeal to Eddie's humanity. And though he's dying, his sweeter side comes out through his interactions with Naoko and Shane, you know, for a minute there, I was starting to like feeling human again. Eddie actually ends up accepting his impending death, happy that he's going to die a human and not be consumed by the symbiote again. Unfortunately, Carnage has other plans, but Eddie was fully willing to die even with the symbiote in front of him, the last chance to save his life. No! I want to stay, Eddie Brock! Whatever the price! This is just so heartbreaking and honestly one of my favorite Venom stories ever. And ultimately, Eddie is the other character in this episode to showcase great responsibility. In order to save Naoko and Shane, he re-merges with the symbiote, even though it means giving up his chance to die with dignity, to die as Eddie Brock. We've seen stories where Eddie gets redemption as Venom and sacrifices himself before, but the idea that Eddie has to sacrifice his own humanity to help the people he cares about, to give up his own dignity and become Venom again, even though it's the last thing he wants, that is an amazing Venom story. Eddie embracing his great power and his great responsibility. This episode, in my mind, justifies this entire series' existence. One of my my favorite animated episodes of Spidey that I've ever seen. But overall, there were a lot of issues with Unlimited that kept it from truly shining for me. The buy-in for the entirely new world, the beast deals in general, a slew of new unfamiliar side characters that were only occasionally interesting, and, in my opinion, a very lackluster main antagonist. While each of the three major rebel characters, Git Hoskins, Daniel Bromley, and Karen O'Malley, all got some decently fleshed out backstories eventually, none of them really felt all that compelling outside of the episodes devoted to their histories. Git's backstory was tragic, Bromley had a tumultuous history with his brother, and Karen's ultimate blood connection to the High Evolutionary, these were all interesting, but none of them made me really connect to the characters on a level that I'd have liked. Occasionally, the Knights of Wundagore had some compelling character traits. I particularly liked Lord Tiger, who seemed to think for himself about each individual situation, and never went along with the other knight's plan just because. Lady Vermin's flirtations with Spidey were fun too, but there's not all that much more to it. And sadly, outside of one great Venom episode, the symbiote's overarching story did not do much for me either. Though I expect that had we eventually seen more in regards to the Symnoptic and its plan to further expand the symbiote hive mind, this maybe could have been interesting. And of course, the saddest of all, the series ends on a brutal cliffhanger, as symbiotic spores launch out of Counter-Earth, threatening to end all life on the planet. And that is literally how the series ends. Damn, how many of these Spider-Man cartoons just end on cliffhangers? Can somebody finish a damn Spider-Man story? <laughs> Ultimately, I do think Spider-Man Unlimited was a very cool experiment that didn't entirely pay off. I'm glad it exists, there are some great stories in here, but I can see the groundwork for better stories laying beneath some that ended up feeling lackluster. I think that writer Will Munio's quote about his time on the show sums up exactly why this didn't quite work. I got to work with some great people, and there are some nice action sequences in some of the episodes, but I wish we could have done the real Spider-Man as originally planned. And that's the main change I would have liked, just being allowed the honor of doing a straightforward adaptation of the books I loved as a kid. I think that's hard to argue with. And even after they were denied this, they came up with a pretty compelling counter-Earth premise with an antagonistic Peter Parker, and even that idea was thrown away due to Marvel's own misguided perceptions of what the fans wanted. And even after all of that, they ended up canning the show on a cliffhanger, never allowing the creative team to hit their stride in the premise that they had to craft around all of the interference. It seems 
seems like the creative team was stifled at every turn while making the series, and while I do think some great stuff came out of it, they were never really given the opportunity to make something they believed in. And that is a shame, because there was some very creative and satisfying work done on Spider-Man Unlimited. And while I do think it's likely going to just be a relatively small cameo, it's kind of exciting to me that we're going to see this version of Spidey in the Across the Spider-Verse film. I don't think we should expect anything substantial, but it's cool to know that this series' legacy lives on. Johnny!